it's seven minutes past. So uh, when I was searching online for you know what people said about translation, there's obviously a lot of a lot of positive, a lot of negative, a lot of loss, a lot of um, gain, a lot of uh, talk about culture and and how how we cannot actually ever understand you know a poem and and be, make the exact copy of a poem in another language. Um, but this quotation by Ken Liu, the, the same person I, I quoted in the, in the email with the link, said this. Whatever has been lost in translation in the long journey of my thoughts through the maze of civilization to your mind, I think you do understand me. And you think you do understand me. Our minds manage to touch, if but briefly and imperfectly. Does that thought not make the universe seem just a bit kinder, a bit brighter, a bit warmer and more human? We live for such miracles. So welcome to uh, November Stanza. Um, no, uh, stanza is a concept, a concept of the Poetry Society. So the Poetry Society has created these stanzas in different areas of the UK and also in several countries and the aim of stanza is to bring poetry to all. So whether we are poets or just people who like to read poetry or those who want to try to enjoy poetry and understand how to read poetry, these stanzas are open to all. Um, and that's why they are conducted free of charge also so that they, they are accessible. Um, some housekeeping, as I said, I'm having a few <laughs> technical difficulties, so if there's something going on that I'm not seeing, please use the, the chat facility so that I can try to fix it. Um, it is an informal meeting, so do keep yourself unmuted and obviously while respecting um, especially the time of our panelists and you know each other try not to speak over each other and, and I know on Zoom it can be it's a bit difficult to coordinate that but we'll try. Um, this session is being recorded and I probably will not be taking pictures because I can't see anything. <laughs> uh, there will be time for questions um, uh, you know following my own questions so if you have any, do write them down and keep them for later or put them in the chat and I will, I will post them to our guests uh, later on. I'm a little bit worried that people aren't turning up because this might mean that the link isn't working. Yeah. Do you yeah. want one of us to take a screenshot for you? Uh, yeah, that would be great, Lara. Thank you. That would be great. Okay, so I'm going to let my guests uh, introduce themselves, maybe give us some background, tell us why you translate, and maybe a fun question, what is the last thing you translated and which aspect of it did you enjoy the most? Or, or if it's the case, the least, just something remarkable about the last thing you translated. Um, so let's do this in alphabetical order. Clara first, please. Okay, hello again. Nice to meet uh, everyone. Thank you again for the invitation. Um, so my name is Clara Burghella. I am a Romanian born poet, uh, translator, editor, and in my everyday life, while I'm, while I'm not translating at night, that's a, an inner joke in my family, during the day I teach English as a foreign language. Um, I have just had my second poetry book published and I'm in the middle of translating um, um, the second collection by the same author, Stefan Manasia, one of the most uh, well-known Romanian poets. Um, I will be reading uh, a poem from the collection. And the thing that um, I'm, the, the thing I appreciate uh, a lot about this collection it is how visual and sensual it is and that um, it pays closer attention to form. So I have to, I, there are a couple of poems that um, 
uh, that are very specific in terms of form. So uh, this sort of like uh, um, makes me flex my muscles, uh, but uh, I enjoy uh, nevertheless the process. So I hope this kind of like answers your question. Uh, so far, nothing challenging, but fingers crossed. <laughs> Sorry, thank you, Clara. Uh, Sean? Uh, yeah, hi, everybody. My name's Sean. I was, uh, I was born up in the, the wild north of Scotland, where one of the few places the Romans didn't get to, or, or rather did get to, and then just turned around because there was nothing there, and it was too cold. Um, so I lived in Scotland until I was about 23, 24, and then I moved to Italy, where I've been ever since. So I've been here the guts of 20 years now. Um, so yeah, my, my Italian is, I, I can read and I, I feel pretty confident in translating now. I never, um, I used to translate things that I really liked, but it was very, about once or twice a year in terms of poetry. But then I was speaking to a friend of mine and as usual, like most poets, I think I was finding about how weeks and months can go past and I don't write anything. And he said, well, when that happens to me, I just translate other stuff. And I thought, well, that's a good idea. I'll just piggyback on someone else who's done the work. So after he told me that, I picked up a, a book of surrealist uh, poems. And the funny thing about it is now they might have been surrealist at the time, but they don't seem particularly surreal now. Maybe the whole world has just gone that way. They just seem perfectly normal now. Um, so I, I started doing that, and I, I really liked it. And I liked the... Um, um, I like the process, as Miriam said at the beginning, of trying to get of, of trying to get in touch with that other mind and that other way of thinking, and uh, then hopefully I liked adding adding a little bit of myself to it. Um, the last the last thing I translated was the Montale poem called uh, "The Lemons," which is quite a famous um, it's quite a famous poem that that. That opens the, that opens a book called um, Cuttlefish Bone. Um, <clears throat> the, and I think the most satisfying thing about it was I didn't read it all from beginning to end before I started translating it. So as I was translating, it was kind of unfolding, and a lot of it is quite odd and not very direct. And then suddenly you get these last four lines that are just completely golden and um, luminous, and. The, as I translated them, I wasn't thinking at all about the rhyme, but they came out more or less perfectly rhymed, the last four lines. And I was like, oh, I put the pen down. I was like, oh, that's, that's a good job. Well done. So that was nice. Uh, and that's me. Yeah. Miriam, should I go ahead? Yes, please. Sorry, are you hearing an echo? Yeah, when you speak, yes. Okay, so I'll just jump right in. Um, so I, I came to translation by a, quite a roundabout route because my my thing was teaching first, um, and I taught courses for six one then university English department. Uh, eventually moved to translation to teach um, uh, theory and history of translation and semiotics, which is what my PhD is in, and thought you know can't really do this. I um, you can't just keep talking about translation without doing it. Um, so I decided to start a sort of apprenticeship by translating uh, short stories, because I thought you yeah, have such a collection of voices there and you know everyone is taking you somewhere different. So I thought that would be a good way to start. And I also did that with a copy editor, um, um, uh, Mary Ellen Curran, who has been working in editing uh, translations in all different fields for many years. And so she was like a mentor as so I, I built up. Um, so I, I about three collections of short stories and then um, was approached to translate poetry, um, which I didn't have much experience of except with students as sort of as classwork, which is great because you, you know, you really tear things apart and open them up and anyway so I was I was approached um, to um, apply to translate the national poet um, Dunkarm Saila 
Um, it, it's actually a second translation of his into English. Um, it, it was the only language uh, it, was, it was already translated into English. And now he's come, it's um, they're going to translate his work, 40 poems in five different languages, including Chinese, Arabic, um, Italian, English, and um, Spanish, I think. Um, so I'm doing a, a second translation, which was a bit challenging. So I decided not to read the, the first translations. I didn't want to be influenced one way or the other. And you know, just sort of built up my own response and then looked at the, transla the earlier mm -hmm. translation. So I was sort of um, dreading it and looking forward to that the whole time. Um, but a few of the things I expected to find, I did find. They're 60 years old, and I thought the language would be a little more, you know, sort of a little older. And it was actually a bit close to the language of English Romantic poetry, which makes sense because they considered Duncan to be a Romantic poet. And I think in translating him using that sort of vocabulary, they were... They had an eye on the audience and how they would uh, relate to him. And I did it differently. I wanted him to sound like um, the, the things he's saying are still relevant today. Uh, I know there's a lot of church. He is a priest. Um, but that's fine. That's him. And that's the way he looked at the world around him. And I wanted it to sound more immediate. And I think I managed. Maybe not in all, but um, I, on, on the whole, I think. <laughs> Good. I'm so, looking forward to that, Claire. So, could you say could you say the name of the poet again, and where is he from? The so he's Maltese. Oh, he's Maltese. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have said that. I'm Maltese. Okay. okay. Um, and so I'm translating from Maltese to English. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And his name is um, Carmelo Psyla. No, but when he became very said Dun is one of the um, forms of address, and he tends to be known by a shortened, familiar form of his first name, Dun Karm, um, okay. or Dun Karm Saila. Okay, thank you. Sorry about the silences. I'm I'm navigating on uh, <laughs> three screens now <laughs> to try to <laughs> maybe watch this thing, <laughs> um, but it's fine. So. Um, I'm, but I'm very worried about the uh, six or seven people who we don't have here, and I don't know what happened. So um, I guess we'll just carry on because nobody has contacted me. No. Okay, well, it's nice to talk between us and Lara. Lara is a poet, and and uh, um, we we know each other we know each other very well. So I'm sure I know Lara having, too. She's having fun as well. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, sorry, you're on you're on you kind of on your own, but you're not on your own. You're with us, yeah. but uh, um, I don't know. It's just one of those days, you know, when things don't work. So, so I just uh, made that face when you said I'm a poet. Well, I write poetry. I don't know if that makes me a poet. I write poetry in my own time. Um, poet with a capital P in a bard like sense. I don't know. No, I can't live up to that. Uh, well, um, I kind of I, I know your poetry, Lara, so I don't I don't call you a poet as a as a throwaway thing. I, I your poetry is very good. How so <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, and you should start. You should start owning it. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut up. But, but maybe I will. will. Maybe you will. Maybe you will. I see. Yeah, uh, I write. I just say I write poetry, but um, it feels so heavy. I think everyone can imagine what I'm trying to say. It feels so heavy to say I am a poet. It I is. still remember the first time I said it. It was quite liberating. I wasn't expecting to have to say it, but <laughs> I said it and I was like, oh, yeah, no, it's true. It, that's, that's, anyway. Yeah, no, it does. It does come with, uh, you know, a few connotations and uh, it, uh, also the way people perceive you when you say I'm a poet. And in my case, I remember being introduced as a poet before I was owning the, 
the title and I had a, a, fr a friend who was knew a lot of artists and has an art gallery and he was introducing me at a party to everybody he knew as a poet and after that I kind of had to, to kind of swallow my pride in a way and say okay um, um, so a few days ago I was at uh, an event at the book festival and uh, um, one of the during one of the discussions again about translating poetry by by Inizia Med the association that uh, organizes a yearly um, festival called the Malta Mediterranean Literature Festival, which is based on translation. So we always have people from um, around Europe, or around the Mediterranean, but really from, from anywhere. And uh, before the festival starts, there are several days of workshops during which we have, you know, um, intense hours of translating each other's works and uh, one of the people who who has been through this process um, called it a, a, a trans creation so um, a, a concept of you know describing adapting a message from one language to another but also uh, using your creativity while while doing so uh, and another term that has been used is a is trans substantiation. So um, when one poem becomes another poem, so we're we're trying to keep the essence. No, we're keeping the essence, but we are rewriting something else. And um, another important point, which I really believe in, is that in order to translate a poem, you need to be a poet. And I know I am aware that there are people who are translating um, poems, but they are they never write anything themselves, and they are rather good at it. So, so that is not to say it is exclusively the work of a poet, um, but I do believe that it's not for everybody because not not everybody perhaps can grasp or wants to wants to grasp the nuances and the 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 devices that are going on in a poem, no? Um, so what do you think about this, this transcreation, the transubstantiation? Um, and, and how do you feel about the work you do? Um, shall we go in reverse now, Claire? Well, um, all translation is rewriting and interpreting. Um, it's never just the thing that it was it's always the thing and something more and that something more is what you bring to it inevitably you you it can't stay the same if it were the same it wouldn't be translated so um translation is a form of creation or recreation um but i find what's what it's you know it's 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 almost the opportunity to dive into the the words and not have to worry about all the other stuff I mean, if you're writing something from scratch, you have to think about everything. This is fun. You just think about the words. Um, transubstantiation, I find, is a little over the top. You know, I leave that to the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sean? Um, yeah, the, the definitely I feel like there's there's an element of creation and sometimes I still feel a little bit wicked when I do it when I've taken the guy's line I'm like nah I'm gonna no that I'm gonna change that I'm gonna make that into something cooler because it's very presumptuous but the it, it, it is it's definitely part of the pleasure um I've never gone as far as just trying to take the essence of something of a poem and then trying to recast it in my own words because that's almost something that you would do from one language to another like if you absorb a poem in your own language very well the essence of it reaches you and like any subsequent poem that you write on that same theme might also be considered uh if we're speaking about essences might also be considered a kind of um transubstantiation i know that like the I'm sorry to bring his name up again. I don't read all that much from him, but I know that thousands of people have translated The Eel by Montale. And I think it was Robert Lowell's version of it had almost nothing in common 
with the with the original in terms of the vocabulary, in terms of the syntax, in terms of the flow. But somehow it's still it was still the the Montali poem in some way. But that seems to me, I mean, I don't do it very often. Maybe I will get to that point, but I, I like to I like to be building something around the, the the structure of the of the original without completely abandoning ship. You know? mm. Claro. Um, so um, I've, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with transcreation. Like I wouldn't say, I shouldn't say familiar, but I, I know what it means. And I think I understand that it sort of like relates to what I do as a translator, except that my target is not branding or marketing. So, um, and I also know that transcreation also involves using, uh, you, uh, using some visual props at times, uh, which is something that I haven't done. Uh, I haven't had uh, the chance of translating anything that departed from traditional poetry. Uh, so um, if do I have an opinion about that? Anything that um, uh, falls into the creative realm, I think it's... Uh, it's, uh, it, it's wonderful because as Sean said, like I find myself having days when I cannot, um, um, I don't feel uh, that I'm um, um, inspired enough to produce my own poetry. And it always helped uh, to either read or translate. So there are days when I simply start by translating before I even um, um, make up my mind about uh, whether uh, I feel like uh, writing anything. Um, other than that, I think that the way I see the process is pretty much as a close reading. So for me, translation is above all, or first of all, uh, an act of very close reading, which is different than the act of reading per se. Um, it's, um, it's not only getting, uh, you know, uh, being familiar with the author and the text and then, um, sharpening all the linguistic tools at hand. It's um, about sort of like creating a connection with the text, like bonding with the text. And I feel that this takes um, um, sometimes depending on the source text, uh, several, you know, I would say days, but then um, I found myself putting aside the, the, the work and then coming back to it with a fresh eye. So I don't, I cannot, you know, enter the, the translation process without a very close uh, reading. Uh, so um, that would be what works for me. And then I try to, being a teacher, um, I teach grammar. So it's, it's a pain in the, you know, these days with kids, especially online. And you, I feel like I, I, I always have to connect it to something that sort of like translates into the real life. So it's like, why do I need to know about verbs or mode or so on and so forth? So I, 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 I see translation working in my life in the same way. I see a connection between translation and teaching, and I see a translation uh, connection between translation and poetry writing and editing. And if I were to put them all under uh, one umbrella, it would be all of them are somehow uh, requiring um, to um, to begin with an act of imagination. So um, that's th this is the connection that I would probably find between uh, what I do and transcreation. The other one, I haven't read anything about it, and um, but I wrote it down, so I'll look it up later, see uh, <laughs> how I feel um, about it. I'd say um, I, I agree with Clara's transcreation. Uh, so I'm not a translator, but uh, primarily an editor. And for the past five years or so, I've worked extensively with coordinating translations for marketing and websites. Um, uh, and transcreation, you're right, has become quite a big deal in marketing the past uh, few years. Um, in my experience, agencies do not always deliver what they promise when they promise a transcreation service. And it's funny that I, I found it's a better solution actually to have um, a dedicated translator or even better, a content writer um, to, to tackle the subject you, you want to do head on. Now, we're not even talking about poetry here, um, but we have, you know, um, localized terms and keywords, like some basic 
translation principles that are just somehow not really um, not always targeted properly when a transcreation service is involved. It's, it's actually better to write an article from scratch, reword. And now we're not talking about transubstantiation, which sounds pretty metaphysical. Um, and also in my experience, seeing um, some translations to Maltese from English, you know, I think some people are very critical of literal translation. It seems to be, um, uh, what's, what's the word, like anathema. Like you can't literally translate anything. Um, it's not always ideal. Maybe it's, it's, it's my um, unpopular opinion, but sometimes it works in marketing. It really depends what you want to say. I think sometimes some people's translations sound better than literal translations because they cheat um, by transubstantiating a marketing article. Um, and then it sounds absolutely brilliant in the target language, but it it doesn't have any of any of the information you need to you need your audience to understand because you've just made it sound great, but it it doesn't communicate what you wanted to communicate. So um, sort of like, it, I just wanted to say how it somehow, even though we're not talking about something creative, artistic, like poetry, I start to see some of the same principles pop up, um, even in, you know, product marketing. Oh, that's, that's very interesting, Lara. Um, in, in, the, in the festival I mentioned earlier, it's actually, uh, you know, contrary to what most poets prefer, the translation, uh, we're encouraged to make a very literal translation of the poem. And obviously then we need to insert, you know, almost artificially, the literary devices that we, we, we can. Um, and often, and because we get the chance to, to speak to the poet who wrote the original, and because also, you know, see all these layers coming in, there's a bridge language. So there is the English translation provided to the Maltese authors and the same for the, for the other authors that might already have some gaps. So, so we, are, we are playing with usually um, the bridge language and then translating it into a third language. And then we are discussing and often, uh, in my case, for example, I was translating a poem where um, I mentioned death. And when I spoke to the, to the poet, it was a Greek poet, she said, no, no, she said, it is quite the opposite. You know, so, so it's amazing how much you can misunderstand, um, especially if maybe the bridge language is not, you know, so faithful to the, to the original. Uh, somehow we have people coming in at 6.30. <laughs> I did write 6 in the email, correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, that's interesting what you're saying, Miriam, that, um, you know, it's it seems to to vary depending on the purpose. I mean, I, I'm, I really believe in context and aims and purposes. Um, you need to be a little bit flexible, I think, in your philosophy about it depending what you're writing for. In, in translation theory, um, <clears throat> there's what we call scopus theory, which is pr precisely looking at the purpose of the translation and determining you know, the, the best strategies for the case in hand. So yes, it is context sensitive, target sensitive, and, and, and very much um, focused on the end user, the new reader, the new market or whatever you have. Um, whereas uh, there are a lot of other ways of looking at poetry or translation that would privilege the source, the original, and try to keep close to that. So uh, different um, translation situations will require uh, perhaps different aims, as you're saying, a different scopus. For instance, this, this translation I had to do of uh, Doom Carms that I was asked to do, um, it really was all about trying to get what Doom Carpsila was saying across, not 
working on my interpretation of it, running away with it, do, doing stuff with it. It was really, I wouldn't say it's literal, but it is as close, I mean, I suppose it is literal in the, as long as it's also grammatical and easy to follow. You know, there are those syntactical issues of from one language to another, but it really, the, the intention was really to be as close, as faithful uh, to what he was saying. So in, you know, the new reader can simply understand why Duncan is national poet, what his themes were, what his ideas were. So I, I really didn't feel I had the, the opportunity there to do what Sean was describing, you know, take a line and, and work with it and challenge, maybe, you know, change it. Could do that, <laughs> maybe, maybe <laughs> next time. I, I was just thinking, actually, that an, an, an interesting case for a, for a translator is someone like um, is someone like Dante, because although people have tried to translate it as a poem, um, and there are very good poetic translations of it, obviously, it's you can't do what what um, what Claire was just saying there. You can't preserve everything from Dante and also make it poetic so mm -hmm. I think that there is a place for those prose translations particularly of the Commedia because when I first read it, it's like I just want to know what he's talking about I'll deal okay. with the poetry later yeah but I just want to know what the words mean first yeah, why then. why is Dante such a you know what, what was it about him that's yeah. carried all these years and it's it's not just the poetry it is also yeah. what it's what he was you know yeah, the history, the politics, everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Great. So. Um, shall we get to the to your translations? Because I'm really looking forward to to hearing them. Um, shall we start with Clara? Um, sure. Uh, should we uh, read the, the original and then the translation, or just the translation? I would love to hear the original as well. The original. So, um, as I said in the beginning, I was thinking about the conversation, which sort of like, uh, uh, you know, uh, reminded me of the whole uh, gain and loss, like <laughs> what it's gained from the translator's perspective, and also what you sort of like lose on the way, because uh, depending on context um, uh, and aim and purpose, um, um, you focus on uh, either form, content, or... Um, for me, it's also absorb uh, absorbing, so, sort of like incorporating the personality of the poet. So I'm lucky, uh, the poet I, um, I'm about to read from, Stefan Manasia, um, is someone who is uh, accessible. So I have been able to sort of like reach out to him uh, whenever I stumbled upon something or I felt that I was on uh, uh, shaky grounds or, you know. So, um, and then before sending, you know, the whole collection to the publisher, I, I sent it to him and I wanted to hear uh, how it felt. I'm, I'm, when you, because um, I think you, you uh, I, I have the same approach within a poem as I do uh, with an entire collection. I wanna make sure that it works um, uh, on, on the whole, right? That is sort of like uh, has its own pace and pulse so um, that was very important for me. Um, so the poem I'm about to read is called Miracolul or The Miracle. It's a short poem and um, um, it's about the poet. I'm giving you guys the context, you, uh, the poet and his little girl, uh, Estera, uh, on, a bus, uh, on a bus ride. So I'll read it first in Romanian. Well, see how much you can uh, get shown from, from uh, the Romanian language, like any resemblances to Italian, <laughs> okay? Uh, so, Miracol, frunzele roșii rezist în paharul de sticlă. Îngeri ai căror nume nu-l cunosc, le presar între paginile cărții poetului mort, de-al cărui nume promit să mă dezvăț. Puțină apă, sticlește ca vodka și tortura lor îmi pare atrăgătoare. Din autobuz i-am arătat Esterei copacul roșu ca în anotimpurile lui Kim Kiduk. 
Era teamă că o să accelereze șoferul, iar va pierde per sempre miracolul. So this was the Romanian version. And now I'm going to read the translation into English. The miracle. The red leaves struggle in the glass. Angels whose names I do not know. I press them among the pages of the dead poet's book, whose name I promise to learn. A little water glittering like vodka, and their torture seems attractive to me. From the bus, I showed Estera the red tree, like the one in Kim Ki Duk's spring, summer, fall, winter, and spring. I was afraid the driver might throttle up and she would per sempre miss the miracle. Stefan Manasia's poem. Thank you, Clara. That is beautiful. Thank you. I love, I, I love to hear poetry even when I'm not understanding it. So um, a, little, a little treat for me, to be honest, uh, to hear it in both languages. Thank you. <laughs> I I'm like the, the same mind. <laughs> keeping that pair sempre at the, at the end. That's a really nice yeah. time. Yes. Very. I love the too, Claire. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Sean? You're you're on mute. On mute. Okay. You want me to, to read something? Your translation, please. Okay. Do we want to put it up on the screen or should I just read the Italian and then the English? Uh I can put yeah, it yeah. up on the screen if you like, but uh, just for people to, to also see the French version. Um I don't know if, if if there is, I don't know if the, if this is okay with you. If there is someone who can read French, then maybe they could read the French and then I'll do the Italian and the English so we can see the, the progression. I don't know if that's taking up too much of our time. I can read the French if you want. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. is is the... Should I read the French first? Yeah, if I think if, because it started okay. in French, then it went okay, to sorry. Italian, the English sorry. one. So. No, no, it's a... Okay. L'amoureuse. Elle est debout sur, mo, sur mes paupières. Et ses cheveux sont dans les miennes. Elle a la forme de mes mains. Elle a la couleur de mes yeux. Elle s'engloutit dans, dans mon ombre, comme une pierre sur le ciel. Elle a toujours les yeux ouverts et ne me laisse pas dormir. Ses rêves en pleine lumière font s'évaporer le soleil, me font rire, pleurer et rire, parler sans avoir rien à dire. Okay, in, uh, in Italian, unless there's a native Italian speaker here, I don't want to butcher this if there's someone who can do it properly. Eh? Uh, but, okay. I don't think so. Okay, l'innamorata. Mi sta dritta sulle palpebre e i suoi capelli sono nei miei. Di queste mie mani ha la forma, di questi miei occhi ha il colore. Dentro l'ombra mia s'affonda come un sasso nel cielo. Tiene gli occhi sempre aperti, né mi lascia mai dormire. I suoi sogni in piena luce fanno evaporare i soli. E io rido, piango e rido, parlo e non so che dire. So that's the Italian one and the English one, uh, the woman in love. That's her standing on my eyelids, her hair tangled up in mine. She is the shape of my hands. She is the color of my eyes. She sinks into my shadow like a stone dropped in sky. Her eyes are never closed, so I am not given to sleep. In broad daylight, her dreams vaporize suns and laughing, crying, laughing. I have nothing to say and I say it. Beautiful. Mm, it's a nice one. It's beautiful. So you also have uh, another one? Oh, but now I feel really like this. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. What do you feel? <laughs> no, that it's like I, I just got three for the price of one. If I do another three here, we're... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, shall, we, shall we do French, Italian, and English again? Or Okay. Okay. La lampe, le dormeur, bouche, tu auras bu à la saveur obscure, à une eau ensablée, 
à l'être sans retour. Où vont se réunir l'autre amère, l'eau douce, tout aura bu au bris, l'impartageable amour. Mais ne t'angoisse pas, ô bouche qui demande, plus qu'un reflet troublé, plus qu'un qu ombre de jour. L'âme se fait d'aimer, l'écume sans réponse, la joie sauve la joie, l'amour, le non-amour. I forgot the full stop. Ok, okay the Italian one. Um, il lume il dormiente, bocca, avrai bevuto al sapore oscuro, a un'acqua sabbiosa, all'essere senza ritorno. Là vanno a riunirsi l'acqua amara e la dolce, avrai bevuto ove splende l'amore incondiviso, ma non angosciarti, bocca che domandi più di un riflesso intorbidito, più di un'ombra di giorno. L'anima si forma amando, la schiuma senza risposta, la gioia salva la gioia, l'amore il non amore. From the lamp, the sleeper. You'll have drunk mouth at the dark tang, the gritty water, the no going back. Where sweet and bitter waters flow to merge, you'll have drunk the shine of fruitless love. But don't torment yourself, mouth that demands more than murky reflection, more than day shadow. Souls are forged in loving the mute foam. Joy saves joy, love, not love. Mm. I think this deserves a Romanian and the Maltese translation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what do you think? Yes. <laughs> Greed. Really beautiful. And now I'm, I'm, I would uh, think twice about like what language to start translating as source language. Yeah, yeah. But the but poem was what's the original form? Short, uh, sorry. The original, the original one is in French. Yeah, the original is French. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But I wouldn't That's have been able. To, I, I wouldn't have been able to translate it from French without some laborious work with a dictionary. So I went through the the Italian one. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, the Italian, there's a lot of the sort of language of uh, the Petrarchan kind of oppositions, uh, you know, bitter and sweet and uh, mm -hmm. love and not love. It's mm -hmm. all very, very Petrarchan, and all the, the, the language that goes back, I mean, to the 14th century, that sort of oppositional metaphors, the sort of torn apart and and reflected in the balance of the of the of the line the mm -hmm. uh, very much in, okay. a, in a in a no tradition but it seems that's it's very strong in the italian one i'm not sure it's like that in the french in the original so is it something that the italian poet is bringing from his own poetic background yeah it, it's it, it yes. could be I'm, I'm afraid i don't know uh I don't know enough about it to be able to to be able to answer knowledgeably, but there are there are some choices where it seems that the Italian translation has gone for a kind of poetic and in inverted commas, capital P, yeah, kind of declamatory, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where the French one does seem just a little more not conversational, but not quite as syntactically uh -huh. removed uh -huh. from normal language. And I, I see you've taken a lot of liberties with the punctuation and the the no line starting with the uh, you know capital letters. You, you uh, know, impose your yeah. How, how why? Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is always a bit of a like when I first started writing poems. I think like I don't know probably like most people uh, of my generation. Um, all the poems that we read, the lines began with capital letters. That's just what a poem was. And I think the last person who did it religiously, for want of a better word, that I know of was Ted Hughes. He never wrote a poem without, as far as I know, without putting capital letters at the beginning of each line. Um, but then after that, I mean, I remember sending my poems to, um, to a kind of editor to get some feedback on them. And she was like, take away the capital letters at the beginning <laughs> of the line. It's not, people don't do that anymore. Um, Cummings. Mm, yeah, <laughs> so no, none at all. You know. um, so I think it, it just I like the the not put the not capitalizing everything. Um, I think gives you the the flow of the sentence inside the inside the form as opposed to just the the line breaks. 
Mm. So the the from a certain point of view, possibly the enjambment just sticks out a little bit more. Yeah with that but it was really just a question of habit I, I didn't even think about it till afterwards I thought oh, I've taken away all the capital letters <laughs> and just... then you put them in the no going back ah right yeah well okay <laughs> okay yeah because his I think the capitalization of essay which is actually being yeah. um to, to be without return um it took it took me a, a few goes to think of a decent translation but I thought the no going back was mm -hmm. um yeah, I quite I yeah. quite like that. But I want there I did want to keep the capital letter because he's kind of reifying the mm -hmm. the, the 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 abstract idea. So I wanted to make it clear that it was like a, a proper name, as it were. So so when you look at yours in an English context, it it looks right, it fits, it's it suits the expectations of a contemporary English language poetry reader. Mm -hmm. And the Italian also fits the context of the mm, um, sort of used to reading poetry kind of reader as well, working within the, the um, expectations mm -hmm. in a way. So both the translations are working into a context um, and their reception. You're looking more at, the, at, at where the poem's going than where it's come from. Okay. <laughs> Okay. When was this written? The original, um, I mean. The Bon Foi. Uh, hold on a second. Oh, God, where's the book? Um, I, <laughs> I, I'm guessing somewhere around the 80s or the 90s. Sometime around that. The, the 1980s or 1990s, I mean. It's oh, okay, uh, okay. Possibly okay. a bit earlier. Hold on. He was... Where's my book? If you just give me a second, I'll go... Oh, no, I'll tell you what. I'll just... Uh, sorry, yes, I'll put it in the chat. His name is, uh, his name, I forgot to put it in the title. His name is Yves Bonfoy. I think that's how you pronounce his name. I would have said Bonfoy because I'm an ignoramus. I was corrected to Bonfoy. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's round about the ninth, because I mean, he's in the Surrealist collection, which means he must have started writing round about the, the, the I suppose, the 20s, 30s, something like that. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think he died in the early 90s, and this was one of the later poems, but I, mm. I'm not very sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you. Claire, don't carm. <laughs> well, I, I didn't think of preparing a slide like that. So what a good idea to actually see the poem. I didn't think of it. Next time, we <laughs> will back. <laughs> um, Claire, is it available online, perhaps the original, or, or is it not the Don Karma? Yes, but yeah, you might just find it. Um, uh, what is it called? Maybe I'll do just a so, quick search. Um, Don Karma has some very long poems. Um, uh, he's, he's, he has this very famous existential poem. It's about uh, 20 pages long. Um, so, he also has some very pretty short ones. And so I chose this little one. It's one of his early ones because he, he first used to write in Italian um, and never thought that Maltese was actually capable, good enough language to write poetry in. And, and um, that he was challenged uh, by a friend to write a poem, which he did and, and slowly um, he changed completely, would never touch Italian for writing poetry again. And this shift and looking at the language and the way you can describe, you know, what there is around you in sort of the, the right words. Um, he, it's one of the reasons why he's considered the national poet. He's oh my God, sorry, but I'm quite excited. Just a bit yeah. nerdy, but I'm very pretty excited to hear this in English. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> me too, me too, Lara. Okay. Right, so I'm going to read the, this is a short one called Shema, Candle. Um, Shema. Aun eda tishel wahdek, fo lartal tal madonna, o shema chkeikna. Kolosh sikta madwarek, o lil sinta nar litamel mayin hareksh. Aun eda tishel wahdek, e mint tafel jonna tafel shem shtiddi fo il sheyesh nidia. Fizerni tafelodo, Utafis Sirga, Tahra Tanofsinar, 
taf lil masafi il fawja friska il fuiha tazar tal-larinch tal-ward tasata u tiftakar in nahal bize izanzan fdik il festa helwa ta daul ta jmil ta ana u haya jdida awni saeda wahdek tishel idup tintem pal alp mahroa min imhabba gbira is dint jayt pshara u lil sinta nar li tamel tenni il kelma li din lom sabeha mil alp tal jonna tal widin tal raba islim lil mahabba il ima I probably should have got somebody who's more first language multi speaking than I am to really bring that out because I maybe slipped on a few. Uh, hang on, we're having some interference. By the way, Claire, apologies, that wasn't meant to rush you into reading the poem. Uh, as in, I wasn't wanting to cut you short. I was just like, literally, like, quite excited to hear this in English. Apologies, sorry. <laughs> okay. And Claire, your reading was fine. Don't worry. Okay, all right. Thanks. Your reading was and great. It, it, may be, it may be just because I'm completely ignorant of the source language, but it just sounds so... It just sounds amazingly rich. It's just full of sounds that, and syllables yes. that I've just never heard. I'm saying it's poetry just, in wow. Maltese is amazing. It is a language of, for poetry. The sound, it's, the repetitions, it's, it's, it's got a, a richness of sound that no matter how simple the subject, um, it's so rich in, in the way it's put together. Mm. Now, English doesn't have that. And if you sort of, you know, overdo the, the repetition of sounds, the onomatopoeia, the alliteration, it sounds a little overdone. So what works in one language doesn't necessarily work in another. And yet that's very much the essence of what his poetry sounds like. So how much of the sound do you bring over? So as I said, the, the intention was mainly to, you know, this is what he was writing about. So that was the, the primary, the primary point. So candle, Shema. Here you stand alone, burning, on Our Lady's altar, little candle. All is silent around you and your tongue of fire does not stir at all. Here you stand alone, burning, but you know the gardens, you know of the sunshine upon dew-covered grass at the dawn of day, and you know the scorching heat at midday. You know the clear water, the cool breeze, and the scent of orange blossom, roses, and thyme. And you remember the bees busily buzzing at that sweet feast of light, beauty, song, and a new life. Here now you stand alone, burning, melting, dying, like a heart consumed with overwhelming love. But you have brought good tidings, which your tongue of fire repeats to this beautiful mother. From the heart of gardens, valleys, fields, peace, love, and adoration. Wow. I really nice. love how you've substituted like the onomatopoeia in Maltese with with the alliteration. That's that's really interesting because <laughs> we have uh, what was done. Uh, what was it in Maltese? Yeah, yeah, it was the in Nahal is in is zanzan fdikil festa helwa the the yeah. In a way, it felt a little like too predictable, but I went for it anyway. Bees busily buzzing at that sweet feast. But that is what he said. And, yeah. It's what you know, said. And it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, it's just that buzzing or this wouldn't be enough. But you added the alliteration there. And it really emphasizes something that's not translatable, which is interesting. The sound, yeah. yeah. What's, what's the Maltese for sweet feast? Uh, helwa, festa helwa. Festa helwa. It's part, you know, there's a lot of Semitic in Maltese. So Helwa is Semitic and Festa is, you know, from Italian and the yeah, yeah, Latin, yeah. and it just comes together. But also like, I don't like, again, I have no idea, but the, also the word for candle sounds Hebrew. 
Is yeah. It, or, Gemma. Yeah. Yeah. I like these sh sounds. I yeah. Think. Long vowels. In fact, um, you know, I, I like to think that Maltese is an ideal language to translate to because sometimes we have options like that. And we have, you know, we have, we can bring the word in from Italian or we can bring the word in from Arabic. And so we have more chances to, to, to play with sound and to play with, um, you know, other literary devices where maybe some languages don't, don't have that, that option. I'm obviously biased, but I think, uh, I think uh, Maltese is very melodic. So it, it really, you know, it really lends itself to, to poetry and to, to translation. Well done, Claire. It's, it's very, very exciting to, to hear our national poet translated um, into English. Um, so at this point, it is seven o'clock, but I hope you can all stay just a little bit longer to take some questions from the audience, if there are any. Maybe there aren't, but we'll see. I can read another little one if you want. Um, yes, that would be great, actually. Yes, please. Okay, it's another even shorter one, and it's called Kokba, which is a star, Kokba. Kemilek tijera filberach ta sema ya Kokba. Shimkin at harit min jensna min ferch ash kishef il tahaitek izmin. Mahruba hafifa palvledja in tijri umate afimkin. Kif melarak le edem ejitu. Fein e at illum narakien. Ut haris utiddi joharsti. Maharsti tintile fil bot. Yakokba, yakokba uddimek il awa tachsibi tir tot. So, star, kokba. How long have you roamed the open sky, O star? Has ever one of us anywhere rejoiced at discovering your age? Swift, light as an arrow. You run without stopping anywhere. How, then, did ancient Egypt see you where I see you today? You shine and sparkle in my gaze, but my gaze is lost in the distance. O oh star, O oh star, before you, the power of my thoughts trembles. Mm. Little, little mystery of astrology, astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Um, I also, uh, when I was preparing for this um, event today, I also found a comment by Saman Rushdie that says this. Um, it's a little bit of a repetition of what we we're saying earlier, but it's nice to point out now that you've read your translations. The word translation comes etymologically from the Latin for bearing a cross. Having been born across the world, we are translated men. It is normally supposed that something always gets lost in translation. I cling obstinately to the notion that something can also be gained. Hmm. I love that because I'm, I feel that um, when we talk about translation, especially translation of poetry, we always worry about what is lost. No, we worry about maybe cultural, um, background. So we worry about uh, what's going on at the time when the poem was written uh, politically, things that maybe we don't pick up because we're of a different uh, culture, we're of a different world, a different time. But in reality, especially when it comes to poetry and especially keeping in mind that the poem once, is, uh, once it's out there belongs perhaps not to us, but to the public and that everybody is seeing it through the lens of their experiences and their time and their culture. Um, even if we are from the same country and we have the same language, no, something that is born in my head and I place on paper, you are reading it in a way that makes sense to you. So, so there is the translation of, my thoughts and my feelings and what I'm going through at the time 
um, that that you are able to read, but you are able to read only knowing what you know in your head, in your in your life. So so every reading maybe is a translation. No, I don't know how you feel about that, but but I you know I I know um, and if I look back and going back to what we were saying in the beginning when I did not call myself a poet and I did not call myself a poet because I I was scared that people would know what I'm feeling what I'm saying what I'm writing about that in effect I was airing my dirty laundry when I showed people my poetry but I quickly discovered that that it's not the case no it's it's nobody knows exactly what we're writing nobody knows exactly um what we've been through and and they are likely to misunderstand likely to read it even if they know us in a way that uh, they see us you know and so and so when we show somebody our poem it is already at its birth a translation mm-hmm. so what harm is there in making you know making more and more of these mm-hmm. if i can just add something not in poetry um which is not my expertise but i am trying my best i'm a little baby next to all of you and um i just wanted to listen um and i feel much richer for having listened to all this i just want to add a, something about um claire talking about the translation of maltese and in the world of in the field of psychology is where i am maybe um that's my field um like when I would have, have to give a talk or a, a workshop, I remember trying to find the Maltese translation of the word shame. It was quite difficult, shame. Mm. And what we had to substitute was with expressions like... Um, yes. 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 Uh, I wish the floor opened and, and swallowed oh. Yes. Or, um, written in Heba, which mm. I wanted to hide myself. So sometimes, you know, in translation, you, you said, I hope something is uh, gained, not only lost. Sometimes if it's ex- um, translated into expressions and visual expressions, I think there's something gained there. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the visual... The, 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 there is, I think you are saying something more there. And in a... In a, a in a very, in a way that's easy t- to visualize, I th- um, you know, that, uh, wanting the ground to open and swallow me up. And you can say it in English as well. Um, it is, it is, it really describes the feeling, just want to disappear. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, strange that we don't have a word for shame considering our... Uh, um... Mistia, mistia. Mm. As the closest, yes. Um, the closest. Not exactly the same. Our simulation. Actually, there is a word, and I asked the prisoners to give me this word because I was doing working with, and they gave me a real Maltese translation, which I found in the dictionary and we never use anymore. So sometimes words are lost. Oh, yeah. Even by time. Oh, yeah. And it's never, this word was never used. What is it? What's the word? I can't remember, but it is in the dictionary, I can assure you. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Angel. I don't know if any of our other uh, members of the audience have a question at this point. Or a comment, it doesn't have to be a question or just maybe your experiences. Um... Priscilla, I don't want to put you in the spot, but I'm going to. I know you also <laughs> translate uh, translate into German. Well, very short. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'm still a beginner. Like I. Um, what what exactly do you, would you like me to say? <laughs> so I was I was just wondering if you have any comments, any questions for for our speakers. Um, if you want to read something, what, what if what I mean. As I said, you don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to put you in the spot. I'm just, we're a small group, um, and uh, I thought I would, uh, you know, just ask if maybe there's any input from you because, 
you are not only bilingual, you are writing, you are writing in a, in a third language even. However, I've really and truly tried out three after now. <laughs> so it's a, it's a start into German because, and then I translated to from German into Maltese, mm -hmm. which was easier <laughs> for me. Um, I, I, I have probably not problems, but I try to, firstly, I, when I try to translate, I translate very literally. And then I look at it again and start um, seeing what actually is meant and what kind of word I can use. Um, but in a way, maybe, I never really know to what extent I, I don't feel as free as other um, real translators do when they actually depart perhaps from the original, uh, because you do find um, translators who tell you that they actually perhaps have departed to a certain extent from the original. Um, so, I, 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 I find it difficult to actually um, see how much I can be literal and how much I can mm -hmm. be clear or more creative. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think, you know, now that how, how it sounds and whether it has captured the essence. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, I think when you are first doing a literal translation and then seeing how you can play with it, I think it's probably um, a really good way to to go about it. I feel, and and I think that I have I have also done that, for example, in the festival um, when I was translating. Uh, pieces from Arabic that I had the English translation and and um, especially when you find a poet where it, it's not your choice you know what poet you have so you find a poet who writes in a completely different way from the way you do mm -hmm. and so you have to first get to know their their rhythms you have to get to know their vocabulary um, the the way just the way they see things and it's a very it's a very intimate thing I find to to sit with someone and tell them so <laughs> you know what, what what are you saying here and 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 why are you saying it um and when you go through it you start you know all these things start coming out that perhaps you didn't read in the poem but that you want to in order to be faithful to to their text that you need to to somehow bring out um so it's interesting when you say and, and i wonder how how everyone else does it because because that's that would also i think be my go-to priscilla i would i would i would tackle it uh, like that you know when when especially when i'm not doing something for fun when i'm doing something for for work um because when it's something for fun i would have chosen a poet that probably sounds a bit like me you know because I, it's going to resonate you know, um, so to a certain extent so that the, the three that i have chosen um uh, two were yours and one was of elizabeth i felt that they actually resonated with me although i did actually in your case reach out to you to ask about something um but yes i i i felt that connection in a way <laughs> oh sweet thank you <laughs> Um, Clara, Sean, and Claire, how do you how do you go about translating something that perhaps wasn't your wouldn't have been maybe your choice it wouldn't have initially caught your attention to translate for the fun of it for 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 a game you know for for inspiration perhaps? I, 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 no, yeah, oh, go go. No, no, oh, go sorry. ahead. Go ahead, please. Um, I was uh, going to add something on um, on um, on the subject that you guys touched earlier about how exposed you feel as a poet to your readership and this idea of shame, right? Especially when you have people sort of like 
you know, bold enough to approach you and ask you, okay, this poem is about this subject or this other subject. And I picked up on a vibe. Are you okay? I had people come up, you know, asking me uh, kind of like awkward questions. And I would have to explain that, you know, you know, the whole concept of persona poems and that you cannot read a, a, a poem or a poet um, with the identity of that person in mind. And that sort of like reminded me the whole, uh, the whole point of this article that I read the other day in Granta. It's, uh, it's called, uh, I think, uh, The Translator I Never Wanted to Be, uh, Mariam Rahmani. And I very much enjoyed it. She described the whole experience of how she, you know, became a translator by accident, obviously, and how she fell in love with, uh, um, with a, a writer. And in the, the article, she mentioned something about um, the immigrant experience, but I think it applies to us as translator. translators. She says that uh, we are uh, told that the, the, that the immigrant experience is an act of translation, that we actually translate ourselves back and forth uh, in these incessant loops, she calls them. And I very much love that because I, for one, uh, when I write poetry, I do not feel as exposed as a person as, um, as I feel when I do translation work because that I uh, approach it in a more careful manner. And this brings me to your question. I, uh, I, I picked Stefan's book uh, on my way to uh, the uh, translation summer school in Norwich in 2017, um, they, uh, the requirement was to bring a book of poetry to work on during the, the week we stayed there. So um, it was my first time actually doing it seriously. Um, and I picked his book because we grew up in the same town. We have the same age and I could, my impression was I would find in his poetry something that was familiar and to a certain extent it was because he, there were poems talking about childhood that I could relate to and familiar places. But then, you know, here came the man who started talking, you know, in a very sensual manner about uh, the extraordinary women in his life. And that sort of like took me by surprise because I had entered the whole conversation with certain expectations. And that was a lesson for me because it sort of like um, uh, taught me to, to um, uh, keep an open minded, uh, to be open minded, keep an open mind when uh, reading. And um, uh, that the whole idea of being in close conversation with the poet you're translating from uh, has obviously some advantages, but also some, uh, um, you know, challenges because uh, to what extent are you translating yourself or like to what extent was I translating myself, uh, Clara and our mutual, you know, sort of like uh, 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 common points uh, or shared experiences. Was I, that raised the question, how, to what extent was I bringing too much of myself on the page? Um, I don't know if it's, if, if it's just me or if you guys share the same experience or have the same questions when approaching uh, a piece of work that feels familiar, but at the same time, like, does, can this work to our disadvantage, I guess? Like answering your question with a question, sorry. <laughs> it's a typical thing for a poet to do. Yeah, yeah. So, so far I find I haven't really chosen the work to work on. It's chosen me for different reasons. So I don't feel that the work is necessarily close to me or part of me or that I necessarily identify particularly with it. It's more like a, a getting to know, like Duncan is something I obviously always heard about, but I didn't really know his work. So it was an experience of getting to know his work and getting to know the man. And I have to say, I, I just, like, liked it more and more as I, as I went along. I really enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed getting to know him. Um, as I did it. I, I didn't really have a, an affinity before. I, I didn't know his work before. 
very well. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So you you grew to kind of like him more and more. Yeah, and and the more I the more I, I liked what I was doing, what he was doing, and mm-hmm. yeah. It's great. I mean, if it were the other way around, you would have been in a spot of trouble or so. <laughs> I think for poetry, yes. Mm-hmm. For a lot of other things, you just get on with it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's work. No, no, it's strong. It's strong. Even as I said it, I said, well, it's work. You have to do it anyway, even if you almost start disliking the, 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 the poetry. But... Um, in the case of the, especially Don Carm's poetry, and I think you need to bring out a sort of subtlety of what he observes, you know, when he's writing a whole poem about the candle and, you know, you need, I, it's good that you liked him, basically. I did, I did, I did. I got to like him more and more. Good, I'm glad. Just, uh, two things have just, just occurred to me. One, when someone mentioned translating yourself, I think it was Clara, um, the, it, it reminds me of, I don't know if you know about Samuel Beckett, obviously a native English speaker, but he wrote his novels and plays in French um, deliberately to make himself choose the language properly without just falling back on things. And then he translated it himself back into English, which I thought must, you know, I've never, I've never been quite sure how that, how that colored the way he wrote prose afterwards. But I mean, his, his prose is absolutely extraordinary and i it's it's such a peculiar thing to do that um i don't know if anyone's ever tried to do that write in another language and then translate it back into their own i mean i've never done it i've never tried to write in italian and then translate it back into english quite a bilingual seems... experience I, I can think of francis abea he's a playwright and novelist and he there's some work that he wanted to write in English and some he wrote in Maltese and some he wrote, I think he did translate his own work. Yeah. That's the real question. Did he translate his own work or did he just write some in English and some in Maltese? And well, I'm not actually sure. Uh-huh. Mm. It's all translating yourself. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. And the, the, the other thing, the other thought that occurred to me was that it's, I know it's, it's a bit una forzatura, but... Um, Miriam brought up the word transubstantiation, and then I, uh, someone used the word anathema as well. And it's 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 addressing to me that we can't really escape, and then with Dun Dun Karm as well, we can't really escape these um, religious echoes because it seems to me that the the translation, the the movement between Hebrew, Greek, and Latin is the, like the Ur translation. It's the foundation. Mm. And founding translation of, of of the place that we live in mm. of the sorry of the new testament i should say in the new testament the old testament it's maybe that's casting a very long shadow over uh, over everything we're doing mm. ah, great well um i don't know if we have any questions or final comments at this point um because I think we've kept everyone long enough. No, no. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you to our guests, Clara, Sean and Claire. It was um, so lovely to have your really interesting discussion and I hope we can have um, many more of these. Um, Thank you to our uh, small audience. you know, it doesn't really matter because because um, everyone who's here is welcome. But you know, I'm glad that that we got to enjoy um, an hour and a half together, even if it was a very intimate group. Um, I will probably place the recording on on YouTube if everybody is okay with that, just to have you know a little uh, legacy for for Maltese stanza. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks for uh, the invitation. Very kind. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, lovely, lovely. Really, really enjoyed it. It was lovely, and I hope it inspires everyone to write and translate more and mm. to explore the world of of um, poetry and translation because it is a a very, very interesting. I find and very um, kind of feels like a game and very satisfying. Mm. Um, 